this morning uh, this week, which was 2 Timothy chapter 1. And I think it's going on the screen in a moment. Um, yeah. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, <coughs> grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers, night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwelt in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace. And uh, again, in, in the tradition I come from originally, you've always had a, a text you were preaching on. Well, if you want a text this morning, it's verse 7. God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. And now I'm going to do something that Andy Stanley does. Some of you know him and some of you don't. It doesn't matter. And you'll think, oh, this is odd. I want you to repeat that verse after me. Will you say with me? <laughs> that one will do fine. <laughs> yes. Okay. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. What did God not give us? A spirit of timidity. Some translations say a spirit of fear. Okay? What did God give us? A spirit of power, of love, and self-discipline. Some versions say of self-control. Some translations actually say of a sound mind. I'll link those together. I want you to remember that verse. If you remember nothing else this morning, will you take that verse home with you? I believe for many of us, that's going to be a verse that will bring us through things this week. God gave us a spirit not afraid. We, we all know what it's like to be afraid, don't we? We all have things we're afraid of. I can remember when I was a little boy, um, being afraid of the dark. Many children are, you know, you've got to have a light on, you can't go to sleep if it's dark and all so forth. Um, Elsie, my wife, is definitely not happy with heights. That would be fair, wouldn't it? She has a fear of heights. Some of you may be afraid of spiders. Um, some of you may be afraid of flying. Some of you are afraid maybe of dogs. I don't know what you're afraid of. I, I went on the internet, as you can these days, and I got a list of phobias, fears. Uh, does anybody know what peladophobia is? <laughs> Almost certainly yes. Does anybody know what palados are? <laughs> well, believe it or not, it's a fear of baldness. <laughs> or of bald people. I'm not looking at anybody in particular around here, okay? Here's another one. How about, how about ketophobia, spelt with a C-H, by the way? Ketophobia, for those of you who are Greek scholars, will probably pick it up straight away. Ketophobia? Well, the opposite of baldness, hairy people. Fear of hairy people is ketophobia. I once knew a bloke who was so hairy, when he took his shirt off, he looked like a gorilla. Honestly, he did. It was amazing. There wasn't a square inch of his body that was covered in, wasn't covered in thick, dark hair. It was horrible. I don't think I've got ketophobia. This is an easy one. Cyberphobia? Internet, nearly. Computers, actually. Fear of computers. Some people are paranoid about that, apparently. Here's a good one. Chromatophobia. I thought that. No, it's fear of money. Yeah. I can't imagine being afraid of money. You know, if you want to test me out afterwards, give me some money and see if I'm afraid. I don't think I will be. Um, all right, then, how about this one, erythrophobia? 
Somebody's going to get that one. Erythro, come on, John. Erythro. <sighs> Erythro, not arithmo. Erythmo. Fear of the color red. Right? You see a traffic light and you run a mile. I don't know. Um, here's another one. Astrophobia. <laughs> Nearly stars. Very good. Lightning, actually. Fear of light. That seems a very reasonable fear. I'm always afraid of lightning if I'm on top of a mountain or a hill and it starts getting stormy. You know, I think, oh, dear. Um, here's a nice one. Homilophobia. That's fear of sermons. <laughs> That's not great. And finally, penultimate, actually. I, I know some of you will know this one. What is tri-sky decaphobia? Tri-sky decaphobia. Yes! Fear of the number 13, tri-sky deca. You see? Anyway, there you go. Um, and there is also, believe it or not, a phobophobia. Fear of phobias. Yeah, that's for people who can't think of anything else to be afraid of, you know? Anyway, um, there's lots of others you could go on, go on, the, on the network yourself. But... There are other fears which are, I would describe, as hidden fears. Many people um, are afraid of failure. And that has an outworking in their lives because they're afraid to start things. They never try anything unless it's completely safe and they're absolutely sure it's going to work or whatever. They're sort of paralyzed by that fear of failure. Maybe you have that. Um, fear of rejection. You know, makes us so afraid to do anything that could maybe draw criticism or give somebody a chance to laugh at us or, you know, get involved in a relationship where it might not work out. Fear of rejection. It seems to me those are quite valid and common and understandable fears. And fear has many faces. Fear can come suddenly, dramatically, unexpectedly, paralyzing in its impact. You know, some of these situations that we sometimes see on the news of terrorist attacks and that sort of thing. You know, it would root, some people say, I was rooted to the spot with fear. And that can happen. But more often, fear appears in more subtle forms like worry. Or an anxiety or a dread that's sort of there all the time in the background. And it just, it ruins our life. It takes away our joy. We're just so anxious and so worried. I wonder if I can ask you a question. As you think about the future, and you don't have to answer this aloud, as you think about the future, how does it make you feel? You see, some of us may be filled with hope and optimism and looking forward to things very positively, but others may just be in dread of what's going to happen next. And that's awful. But there is good fear. Actually, there's two kinds of fear. There's good fear and there's bad fear. Good fear is the healthy, rational kind of fear that makes us jump out of the way when we see a, a car out of control heading towards us, you know? Or uh, we, we see a poisonous snake and we take a step to one side. Or uh, we're on high... I don't know whether you have this. If you're ever up on top of a high building, do you ever feel like you want to jump off? Yeah. It's weird, isn't it? It frightens me to death. It really does. I was, I was once taken up on top of the, um, the, the chapel building at the school where I used to work. And the parapet, well, it, it was actually lower than that desk there. It was about level with my shins. And I was petrified because something in me was saying, I wonder what it's like to jump off. And that happens to me quite a lot. In, I'm fine if the barrier's up to there, no problem. But when it's down really low, you know, bizarre. Um, and in a way, that's good because those kind of fears keep us safe. But it's the other kind of fears, the fears that have a terribly negative influence on our lives, upon the quality of our lives, upon our effectiveness in life. That's what I want to focus on this morning. Fear that's harmful. I believe this is the spirit of fear that Paul talks about. It's the fear that paralyzes us. It's the fear that keeps us doing things that we otherwise could do or maybe should do. It can even make us ill physically. Fear and anxiety. I mean, many people have stomach ulcers, which is caused very often by anxiety. It leads to your stomach secreting more acid than it should, and it literally eats away at the wall of your stomach. That is caused by fear. It's what doctors call psychosomatic illness. Not imaginary, but caused by what's going on in your head. Many illnesses are. In fact, I read once that there are more people in hospital with illnesses of the mind 
than of anything else at all. Some two-thirds, they reckon, of people end up in hospital with illnesses of the mind. I read about a woman in America who died in 1916. She was called Hetty Green. You might have heard of her. When she died, uh, she left a, a fortune of over $100 million, which, you know, in 1916, that was a lot of money. Um, more than it is now. And it was, but she was terrified of losing her money. She was so tight. She ate her porridge cold in the morning to save the cost of heating up the water. And that's true. And when her son broke his leg, she took so long trying to find a free clinic that his leg had to be amputated in the end because of advanced infection. She didn't want to spend the money, even on her son. She was so afraid of losing her money, she never got to enjoy it. That's what fear can do to us. It can do serious and long-lasting, if not permanent, damage. It can certainly stop us being effective or being happy. We can be so afraid of losing our money or our job that we never enjoy our lives. Some people are so afraid of commitment that they can't face the idea of getting married. They sort of want to, but they can't. They're terrified. Maybe it's tied up with the fear of rejection. But there's a failure or a fear of commitment that something's going to happen in their marriage. Some people who are married are like that. They're so fearful that they can't get really close. They can't have the intimacy they should have in marriage because they're afraid of something going wrong, of them doing something or their partner doing something or some disaster coming. Fear makes them lose out. And Christians are not immune from this kind of fear. Fear of failure, fear of all sorts of things. Why don't we share our faith as often as we could? So often it's simply because we're afraid. And we don't always know what we're afraid of. But fear stops us sharing our faith. Fear stops us getting involved in serving the Lord in the church in many ways that we could. People say things like, that. I can't do this, I can't do that. I can't teach in Sunday school class. I can't help in the nursery. I could never be a pastor or a missionary. I, can't, I know I can sing, but I couldn't sing in the worship team. I couldn't stand up there in front of everybody. I can't play an instrument, so you know, I couldn't do that. I can't share my testimony. Fear can stop us serving God. That can't be right. It isn't right. Fear is a serious obstacle. Many people, including Christians, suffer from it, but it need not be. And Paul homes in on that fact in this scripture. Jesus said many, many times to his disciples, don't be afraid, fear not. The Bible is full of that phrase, do not be afraid, do not be afraid. God says, do not be afraid, do not be afraid. In 2 Timothy, Paul tells Timothy, that God has given us a way to overcome fear. Now, I want to make it very clear. I'm not trying to say that you can dispel fear completely. But there is a way to overcome its power and its influence. Paul talks about three things. He talks about, well, you know them, power, love, and self-control, or a sound mind, depending on which translation you look at. Now, all three of those, and I've got to make this clear to you, all of three of those are the result of the change that takes place when you become a Christian. So you can't rely on what I'm going to say next if you're not a Christian. But if you are a Christian, the Bible says you've been born again by the Spirit of God. And becoming a Christian is a case of giving and receiving. We give our lives to God. If you've never done that, you're not a Christian. Well, let me qualify that. If your life is still in your control and you've never thought about allowing God to have control of your life, you're not a Christian. Okay? In case you can't remember ever giving your life to Christ, which many Christians can't, but they live a life which is clearly given to God. When we give our lives to God, that's the first thing. We accept Jesus as our Lord and as our King. We sang about that. We said, through the storm, He is Lord. Is that true for you? Can you say, he is Lord? And will you say it tomorrow and the day after and the day after and the day after when you face those fears that arise in your life that are going to stop you doing something and you know you should do it? Can you say, he is Lord, therefore I will do it? He becomes our Lord, our King. We declare him to be the one we will follow and obey for the rest of our lives. That's the giving 
to him. And we receive, we receive, first of all, forgiveness. Forgiveness for our sins, for all those things we've ever done and ever will do, which we know are against his will. And secondly, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Paul talks about the spirit you've received, Timothy. He is not a spirit of timidity, of fear. The Holy Spirit is not a spirit of fear. If you're in any doubt about the gift of the Holy Spirit being imperative and fundamental to being a Christian, you just look at what Jesus said to his disciples after his resurrection and before he ascended to his father. He said, wait in Jerusalem for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. He said, wait until it happens. Don't do anything because you'll fall flat on your faces. If you go out and try and preach the gospel... Try and serve the needy. Whatever you do, it's not going to work. You need the Holy Spirit. Wait for the Holy Spirit, he said. And the Bible is clear that the Holy Spirit comes and lives in every true believer in Jesus. And interesting enough, again, to go back to the songs we sang earlier. We actually sang this morning, You Are Alive in Us. Now, I hope when you sang that, you understood what it meant. And you said, yes, that's true. He is alive in me. Not because I deserve it, not because I'm worthy in any way at all. We are, what is the old word, broken vessels or earth, earthenware vessels. We're not, you know, attractive. There's no reason why God should come and dwell in us. But he says, I'm coming. You give yourself to me, I'm coming. My Holy Spirit is coming. And he comes. And in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Not in all the other Christians, but not you. In you. You unworthy vessel. He says, who is in you, whom you have received from God. It's not of your own. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. He says, I'm sending my spirit because you're mine. And right into Timothy, Paul reminds him what this means. He says, the Spirit of God gave us, does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline, or a sound mind. You see, it's the Holy Spirit of God dwelling in a believer who brings these things, who brings the power of God, who brings the love of God, and who brings the control and discipline of God into our lives. We don't do it, but we have to depend upon it. We have to take that power and use that power. We have to take that love and use that love. We have to respond to the discipline of God in our lives and have self-control. And we have to have a sound mind by making sure that our mind is focused upon him. There is a part for us to play, but it all is the result of what God has done in us. We're going to take fear as just one example of what God does in us that makes us so different because Christians are different from other people because the Holy Spirit lives in them. You're not the same as everybody else who is not a Christian. I'm not saying everybody else is not a Christian, by the way, but you know what I mean. Christians are different. It's a fact. It's what God has done. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Why? so that we can overcome unhealthy, destructive fear in our lives. I'm going to take the three of them. Let's look at the spirit of power, first of all. What does that mean? Does that mean I have the power to just dispel fear? I don't think it means that at all. I think it means that I have the power to do whatever God asks me to do, despite the fear. Paul in Philippians 4 says, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. So if God wants us to do something, there is no reason for us not to do it because we're afraid. I was thinking about Jesus this morning. Are you telling me he wasn't afraid to go to the cross? Read what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was terrified. He sweated blood. He pleaded with his father, I don't want to do this. But if it's your will. And can we say the same thing? Lord, I'm petrified of this. I don't really want to do this. But if it's your will, I'll do it. You see... That's the power, the power to say no to the fear and yes to what God wants. I've been reading this little booklet quite often now. 
This came from Vineyard. You might have seen copies of it floating around. It's a, a personal study for spiritual renewal. But each day there's prayer for the morning, prayer for the evening. And the end of the morning prayer says this. I choose faith over fear. That really struck home with me. I choose faith over fear. I choose to trust you, Lord, over the fear that rises in me naturally. Fear is a natural thing. As we've seen, it can protect us. But out of control and in the hands of the evil one, it can destroy us. It destroyed that woman and her son. We may still feel afraid as we set out to do whatever it is, but the fear won't stop us doing it. That's the difference. Does that make sense? I mentioned witnessing just now. Well, that's not a problem either. Jesus said to his disciples in Acts chapter 1, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. (laughs) Do you realize that applies to you and me for Christians today? You will be my witnesses. He didn't say you can be. He said you will be. So get on with it. I'm frightened, Lord. Yeah, I know you are, but do it anyway. But Lord, I'm t- what if? Yeah, what if? Never mind the what if. Let's just do it, shall we? Let's go and share the gospel. Let's tell that neighbor. Let's tell that friend that they really need Jesus, that he's the answer. And what about suffering? Well, Paul knew a lot about suffering, and in 2 Corinthians 12, he says this about suffering. God said to me, well, he actually says he said to me, but he's talking about God. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. What's the answer to suffering? God says, my grace is sufficient. For you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. You see, it's not up to our strength. But the power of God, by his Holy Spirit in us, will bring us through. What was that we read just now? Through the storm, he is Lord. Through the storm. Not the storm's gone, thank you for that, Lord, taking it away, but through the storm. You have to go through. Do you remember David in the Psalm, the, the, the 23rd Psalm? Though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, he is with me. He is my comfort, my strength, my power. He is with us. God said, I will not leave you. Jesus said, I will never leave you. You don't have to be afraid because I am with you. Paul was afraid. I'm sure he was. But he went through time and time again various sufferings and trials and God brought him through and that's what he praises God for. David says in Psalm 34, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Not from the things that caused the fear. He had to go through them. But God enabled him to deal with the fear, to subject the fear to the calling of God upon his life. And what God did for David, he can do for you and me. That's the power. What about the love? How does that work? How does love overcome fear? There's a great verse in 1 John 4, isn't there? There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Ooh, that sounds a bit awkward. But how does perfect love drive out fear? Well, it's in the, there's a two-part thing here, I believe. The first thing is this. The love of God. It begins with the love of God. The more that... We know the love of God, his love for us, and the more we love him, the less we will be afraid. It's a matter of trust. When we realize that God will take care of us, it relieves our fear. Jesus said to his disciples uh, on one occasion not to live in, in worry. Why? Because it doesn't do any good. He said, which of you by worrying can add a cubit to your stature? He said, what is the point of worry? It doesn't do anything. It doesn't help the situation. But he went on and said, Do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, or about your body, what you'll put on. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are they not of more value than they? And again, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your Father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. You're valuable to God. He will care for you. He loves you. And Paul in Romans says, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. If you know his love, and you think, well, do I love God enough? Well, it doesn't matter because, again, the Bible says we love him 
we love him because he first loved us. It's our natural response when we discover how much God loves us and we've only got to look at Jesus on that cross to know that. Our heart turns to love him. And you know what? That's where the second bit comes in. As we love God, his love causes us to love others as well. He talks about springs of living water welling up in us and flowing out to those around us. He's talking about the Holy Spirit and he's talking about the love of God. Love for others. And the more we love others, the less fear we have. I thought about that. Think about the things people do for those they love. The parents that will put their own life at risk for the love of their children. The soldiers who will face death for the love of their country. The rescue workers, the firemen, the ambulance people who put their lives at risk very often for the sake of the people that they are serving, who they love. They may not think about it as love, but it's the clearest demonstration of love. Love enables us to overcome our fear. Love cannot survive, sorry, fear cannot survive in an atmosphere of love. Okay, what about the third one? Spirit of a sound mind. A sound mind is very simple. A sound mind is about right thinking. Thinking and remembering God, his power, what he has done, what he can do. Again, when you become a Christian, the Bible says something amazing happens. We are changed. Uh, In Romans 12, it says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The Holy Spirit will renew your mind. He'll change the way you think. So you think more along the lines that God thinks. And when you do that, you can face fear. You can deal with fear. Perhaps it's fear of dying. Paul says we are confident and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Oh, I love that. I wish I could say that. I want to say that, don't you? When we think biblically, we have a sound mind. Fear just doesn't make sense. If you know the word of God, fear doesn't make sense. Right back at somebody mentioned Genesis this morning, didn't they? I forget who it was. In Genesis 15, God says to Abraham, do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield. I am your shield. There's a film. Have you ever seen a film, The Panic Room? Some people have. I haven't, but I read about it. In The, in the Panic Room, it, was, it came out in about 2002, I think. Um, it's a film about a woman and her daughter who buy a house. Now, the house used to belong to a reclusive millionaire who was paranoid. And he had an isolated room built in the center of this house, which was protected by concrete and steel on all sides. It had a thick steel door. It had a, a security system with multiple surveillance cameras. It had a a public announcement system, and it had a separate phone line to the outside that was buried in concrete and couldn't be cut and so forth. And the idea was that if he was under threat in any way, he would just retreat to this room, slam the doors, and nobody could get at him. Anyway, these two women, this mother and her daughter, they bought the house with the panic room. And extraordinarily, um, I think it was the night they moved into the house, it was broken into, and the mother woke up and heard the intruders, so she grabbed her daughter and they ran into the panic room Slammed the doors. The burglars couldn't get in. But unfortunately, um, the phone line hadn't been reconnected. So they couldn't call out. So they were trapped in their panic room. Now, my simple question is, where do you run to when fear threatens to overwhelm you? Where is your panic room? Who do you go to? Where do you go to? Because the best panic room of all is God. And the good news about God as your panic room is you won't be trapped there. In fact, you'll be set free there. You'll be free to do God's will, to do what he wants, to live the life that he wants you to lead. Many people are trapped by their fears. They retreat. They back away. They cut themselves off. They become reclusive. They turn in on themselves, their fear stops them going anywhere, having anything to do with anybody, they are trapped by their fear. That is not God's will. God's will is that we be free. Twice in our songs this morning, you are, you are, you are our freedom. The Lord is my shepherd, David said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. 
I came across a quote from Martin Luther. He said, faith is a matter of personal pronouns. It's one thing to say the Lord is a shepherd. It's another thing to say the Lord is my shepherd. It's all about a personal relationship. And I want to finish with this. Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Is he your personal savior? Is he your personal Lord and King? When you know him that way, you will sense him with you wherever you go. It's not so much a feeling, it's more a revelation or a knowledge of the truth that he will never, never leave you nor forsake you, no, way, no matter where you go. You will know that's true. Sometimes you don't feel his presence, but you still know in your heart of hearts, God won't let me down. I'm secure in him. I, I'm reminded of David and Goliath, you know. David comes out, little boy, little youth, stripling of a lad, and there's this great giant, and all the Israel army is terrified of this giant. I mean, how ridiculous. An army of thousands are petrified of one man. And we have giants in our lives. We have Goliaths, and we come against them, and we're petrified, and we allow them to, 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 to overwhelm us, to, to, to hold us back. What was the difference with that little boy David? How was he so courageous? It was simple. He didn't compare himself with Goliath. If you read what he said, he compares Goliath with God. And he knows, therefore, that he can't be defeated. Can we do that? Do we keep God in the picture or simply look at ourselves? I can't do this. Of course you can't. That's not the issue. The issue is, can God? I'm too frightened. Yes, but never mind that. Get on and do it. That's what God says. Conquering fear isn't about screwing up our courage. It's about depending on the God whom we can trust and love. It's a matter of belief in his words, belief in his promises. We've heard this morning about Weirdale. Years ago, I believe God promised that there was going to be a church in Weirdale. There was going to be provision for the people up there who want to know him, but don't for various reasons. And it's happening. Belief in his promises, belief in his grace. The grace that gives you and me, if we're believers this morning, power, love, and a sound mind. Let's pray, shall we?